If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be uh, in the prophet Zephaniah. You don't hear a lot of preaching on Zephaniah. It's one of those little books kind of kind of stuck away there in the, uh, in the Old Testament. They call them a minor prophet. But remember, the only reason why they're minor is because they're short, because they're, they're, they're smaller. But his word is just as powerful today as it was, you know, uh, 25, 26, 2700 years ago. In fact, it is really pertinent today because everything he says in here and just like some of these other prophets, and I've said this before, everything you read in these prophets, you could read in the Valley News or the Tribune Review or the Post-Gazette, the things that they're saying. And the thing about Zephaniah is, he prophesied during a revival. Uh, if, you, if you read in, uh, like, 2 Kings, and we're not going to turn there, the last good king that Judah had, they had you know, a number of kings, some of them were good, some of them were horrible, but the last good king they had was a, a king named Josiah. Josiah, that's uh, Chuck's grandson is named Josiah. Uh, and Josiah's father was a king named Manasseh. He was one of the worst. Manasseh was horrible. But, he, but Manasseh got saved. If you read the story, a lot of people think Manasseh, he was offering his children to Moloch and everything, and but if you read about it, in Chronicles, Manasseh repented and got saved. But it didn't change the fact that there were consequences to the stuff he did. So when, in, during Manasseh's reign, it, like, it, it really, the, the die was cast as, the, as what, you know, God was going to send judgment to Jerusalem, to Judah. And that was a done deal. Uh, some people believe that during Manasseh's reign, Isaiah was put to death. It's traditional. Okay. But what, uh, when Manasseh's son, Josiah, came to be king, he, uh, they, they brought to him the, the, the books. The, the temple had fallen into disrepair. There, were idol, there was idol worship all over Jerusalem. And when Josiah got old enough to, and he became king and he understood what was going on, he you know, sackcloth and ashes and repented. And, and he began uh, a rebuilding uh, of the temple and the rest restoration of the Passover and the feast days and so forth. And there was a revival, quote unquote, a revival. And it was, oh, you know, oh, a great revival. You know, everything, boy, they really, got, they really got right with God until Josiah died. And after Josiah died, it was right down to where they were before and even worse. Because revival, you know, we hear that term all the time. It's like, we're praying for revival, praying for revival. You know, I don't want revival. I want to see lives changed. Because what happens in revival, and we're going we're to read here. Zephaniah, he, he gave his prophecy during a revival when it looked like everything was going good. But what happens in revival, and historically, even in revivals that have happened in, historically, is, you know, when it first happens, there's a big, like, explosion, boom, and everybody's just caught up in it. But as time goes on, most of them fall away. There always will be a remnant come out of a revival who are truly saved, if the word is preached. There's a, a number of things historically, and, and just uh, uh, briefly, we've all heard of uh, what they call the Great Awakening. Actually, there was like three times what they would call the Great Awakening, is revivals that happened in our, in our nation. In 1720, people like uh, Whitfield and Edwards, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, they began to preach. You know, at that time, in the churches, the preaching was very, you know, the guy would stand up and preach for two and a half hours, and uh, it would be very doctrinal and theological and everything, and the people would sit there and they'd fall asleep and they'd hit them with a stick and wake them up and... And that was church. Well, what was happening is the people were just like fading away. So these people, these revivalists like George Whitfield and Jonathan, they would go out and they would preach fire and brimstone messages. They wouldn't so much focus on the depth of theology, but they were appealing, they were preaching the gospel message. And many people came to know the Lord, or at least many people made a profession of faith in those times. And, and when that would happen, you know, the, the taverns would close down and everybody would get 
everybody would get saved, quote unquote. But what had happened was, you know, after so many years, it would kind of cool off. And one thing that came out of the, uh, one thing that came out of the, that Great Awakening was the Revolutionary War. <laughs> really, that, that had its beginnings in that Great Awakening. Not that I don't believe that Jesus tells us to preach the gospel to have a war, but that's what, that's what came of that. Uh, a few years later, around 1800, there was a second Great Awakening, again an outpouring, uh, your, uh, fervency, religious fervency. And uh, out of that Great Awakening, the Methodists and the Baptist churches became stronger. But out of that Great Awakening also came things like uh, the Seventh-day Adventists and the Campbellites, the uh, Church of Christ and uh, Disciples of Christ, the, the, the baptismal regeneration people, the Mormons. Uh, Joseph Smith came out of that time and started the Mormon church. And again, there was a fervency that went on for a while and it kind of cooled off. Uh, and there was another awakening from about 1850 to 1910. And out of that great awakening, quote unquote, came Pentecostal churches, this church of God and uh, assemblies of God and so forth, the, the outpouring in Zusa Street came, and those, we hear those things, and we think, oh, those were great. But also, out of them came the oneness Pentecostals, and uh, some, of, some of the cults like that, okay? So, every time there was a revival, there would be an outpouring, people would get touched, mostly emotionally, some would truly get saved, many would just kind of go back to what they, were, uh, what they did before, the Welsh revival, how many have heard of that, 1904 to 1905? Everybody talks about what a great revival that was. Uh, they say they, they claim that over 100,000 were saved during that revival. But look at the British Isles today. If you, go, if you read about Britain, I mean, there's Christianity. There are churches there. But if you read about Britain, it don't sound like they, they had a revival where 100,000 people got saved, uh, you know, 100, 150 years ago. Because at that time, and I'm not saying those people weren't saved, but... When, when a revival fervor, the fire of revival, you know, people get touched emotionally, but most of them, you know, emotions kind of wear off. So in any revival, you'll have a remnant who will be saved, and you'll have a lot who might be touched and might who hear, you know. Just recently, you know, there have been revivals, quote unquote, in our land. Uh, how many remember the Bronzeville revival in, in Florida? That church is almost bankrupt right now. The Brownsville, you know, Assembly of God. They're almost bankrupt. At one time, there were people standing in line to get in there because the Spirit was moving. And the fellow preached, that preached that revival. He preached the Word. He preached the Gospel. He preached salvation, repent. And I'm sure that there were many people that got saved at that time, but, and it had an impact, a momentary, a temporary impact, but as time went on and as it, and as it cooled off, there was a remnant who was really saved, but mostly, you know, kind of back to, back to normal. And that's what happened in Josiah's revival. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the heat of that revival, where everybody thought everything was going good, God pulled the prophet Zephaniah aside, aside and he said, here's what I want you to say. His name means, he who Jehovah shelters. Uh, and indeed, God always has a remnant. In whatever situation, however good things or get or however bad things get, God always has a remnant. Now, Zephaniah is the last prophet before the exile. Again, if you know anything about the history of Israel, and I think most of us do, when God pronounced judgment on them, he said that they would go into captivity for 70 years. That's what he said through the prophet Jeremiah. And jo uh, Zephaniah was kind of current with Jeremiah to a certain degree. He said they would go into captivity for 70 years and then be brought back. Well, Zephaniah is the last prophet, the pre-exile prophet. And he, he has some very, very heavy things to say. In uh, chapters 1, let's just read a little bit as we read through Zephaniah. In chapters 1, oh, let's just begin with verse 1. The word of the Lord which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah. In the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. <clears throat> the first thing he says was, I will utterly consume all things from off the land. I mean, he starts right out with a fastball. He doesn't, he's not, he's not easing his way into this thing. 
He says, verse 3, I will consume man and beast, I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked, and I will cut off man from the land, says the Lord. God doesn't play around. When he sends his judgment, it's like we're talking about when they tear this building down. So when the city comes and tears the building down, they, they take the trees, they take everything. It's just like, you strip it. Well, God was getting ready to strip Jerusalem, strip Judah. Because of their sin. He says. In verse 4. I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah. And upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. And the name of the Chemarims with the priests. And them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops. And them that worship and that swear by the Lord. And that swear by Malcolm. You see they were having a revival going on going on, but there were still those people who were, who were still practicing their idolatry. And that's what, like Donna was saying when she was leading worship, she said, you know, people try to be in two different worlds. And you can have a revival going on, what looks like a revival, and people coming to church and getting all, and going down and doing all the things, and when they leave, they just go back and do the same devilish things that they do. See, when God really takes a hold of somebody, he, he produces a change in their heart that they can't, they can't go back and do the same stuff. They just can't bring themselves, even if they try to. You know, when I got saved, there was stuff I tried to do and I couldn't. I, mean, I wanted to keep doing this stuff and I couldn't. I can remember when we were, uh, there was a church who was having like these renewal meetings that we were going to on Sunday nights before we had Sunday night service. And uh, there were all these kids. Kids were pouring into that place. And I mean, and the kids were getting, and here's, here's what happened. When we first started going down there, they would have music, good music. And then they would have preaching, and they would have prayer time. Music, preaching, prayer time. And the more time went on, there was more music, there was more prayer time, but you know what? The preaching time got less, less, and less. Rose remembers. And they had all these kids, and they were going there, and they were getting baptized, and they were all, yeah. they were getting into it. Because, oh. And some of them kids truly got saved. Some of those kids really got saved and on fire for God. But most of them, I remember one of them came up to me one time. And they said, do you think, here was their question, do you think a strong Christian can listen to heavy metal music? And I said, if you was a strong Christian, why would you want to listen to heavy metal music? <laughs> they see, see they, thought it was, they thought it was just another thing they could do on a Sunday night and have fun with the guys and, and go through this and say, oh yeah, and, and, and the, rest of the, the rest of the week. And that's what was going on with, with Jerusalem. They were, they were going through this revival, restoring the, the temple and all this stuff, and Josiah was doing all this stuff. But yet the people still maintained, they still had the stuff in their heart. And that's what really, the, see, when, when God gets a hold of you, revival will kind of change you on the outside. But when God gets a hold of you, he changes you on the inside. Amen. Listen to what he says, I'm just reading a little bit here. He says, and them that are turned back from the Lord, in verse 6, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for him. He says, hold your peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. That's a scary statement. When somebody says the day of the Lord is at hand, that means judgment is here. See, people say, oh, I'm waiting for the day of the Lord. You better be ready for the day of the Lord when it comes. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has bid his guests. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. Man, a boy, an old-time preacher could have a good time with that. <laughs> strange apparel. He's talking about the, the apparel of Egypt. The clothes of the world. And I'm not, I'm not dealing with, you know, the old timers, man, they, they lift that up and tell you women not to cut your hair and men better have 
long sleeve shirts and, you know, it ain't, it ain't about that. It's about what we're wearing, you know. The new man or the old man? It's like the strange fire that Nadab and Abihu offered the sons of Aaron back there in the book of Numbers. It had fire and smoke, and, but it wasn't what God had ordained. In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold, which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day. You know, they had, man, they had jumpers back then. And it, came, and it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that there shall be a, the noise of a cry from the fish gate and a howling from the second and a great crashing from the hills. Howl, you inhabitants of Mactish, for all the merchant people are cut down. All they that bear silver are cut off. Man, they had, a, they had an economic crash in their society. Because the, the folks controlling the money weren't happy with just what they had. They had to have more. Just like today. All these things going on in the world, in, in the world of economy, they're not happening because of oil. They're not happening because of, uh, you know, Paul. They're happening because people want more and they want to make merchandise out of all the people that don't have stuff. They, they want to take the money out of our pockets and put it in theirs. And they found all kinds of ways to do it. And sometimes we're just stupid enough to let them. They say there's a sucker born every minute. Now, now I'll tell you, you know, when that lottery gets up around 200 million, I'm tempted to go buy one of them tickets. I, I haven't. I promise I have. I haven't even, I'm, I'm going, I say, I'll, I'll drive somewhere about 50 miles away and sneak in the store and buy one of them tickets. <laughs> but I haven't. I haven't. But see, that's what, that's what they're selling to people. Money, it's, like, it's like the carrot on the stick. And the people that, that do that, they're laughing all the way to the bank. I don't want to make anybody mad, but I hear, you know, a couple, couple weeks ago, uh, old, uh, you know, Heinz Ward was up there crying. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm have to retire from the, crying all the way to PNC. And people were, oh, you know, I'm sure his heart's breaking. Hey, you, you, you remember who said that? You remember who said that? Anybody know who first said that? Crying all the way to the bank? Remember? It was Liberace. Remember Liberace? Because <laughs> they was making fun of Liberace because he was a little... <laughs> and he was crying. They said, Liberace cries. He says, yeah, I'm crying all the way to the bank. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. I'm getting... I'm getting... I'm sorry. I'm getting silly. You're talking I'm getting... I'm tired. I'm getting goofy. All right. Verse 12. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their leaves that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. All those men who are complacent, the ones who should be crying out to God on their faces, crying out for repentance and, and God's mercy, the ones who are just shrugging their shoulders and saying, well, everything's okay. God's looking for them. And there's folks today, we sit in church today, there are people that would preach and sit in church that shrug their shoulders and say, yeah, well, it's all right, yeah, it's okay. And people in politics and people in government, yeah, everything's going to be all right. Don't they understand we're on the, on the precipice of the day of the Lord, of judgment that's coming. Therefore their goods shall become a booty, and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. The, the, all this investment... And people end up with nothing. Why? Because that's their idols. That's what, they, that's what they love. That's what they put their trust in. This is written to Judah, but it can be written to the United States of America. The great day of the Lord is near. In verse 14, it's near and haste greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. This is what is coming upon all the earth. Because all the earth has rejected God. It says, And I will bring distress on men. 
And they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them, what Donna was saying. All the stuff we can amass on this planet will not stop God's hand. I think of tornadoes and floods. You can't stop rain. You can't stop water. You can't stop wind. And you can't stop God's hand. He says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. See, this is why when we hear about well, we, you know, lately with the, with the Ten Commandments plaque down there and they're taking it down. That's not surprising. All over the United States, you know, the judge down in Alabama where they fired him because he wouldn't take the Ten Commandments off the wall. They got rid of him. Is that surprising? I mean, for, for 200 and how many years has this country lived under this, this, this Christian kind of bubble this almost this delusion that we're a Christian nation. Well, and, and, and people started taking for granted our liberties and our freedoms, and now we're losing them. Why? For the same reason they did. They took them for granted. And even though there was a revival, quote-unquote, going on, hearts weren't being changed. We got all kinds of people going to church. But we got all kinds of sin going on, too. We're ripe for judgment. It says in chapter 2, and just, just jumping through a little bit here. In verse uh, 4, look at verse 4. Here he mentions the nations around Jerusalem. Gaza, uh, the inhabitants of the seacoast, the Cherethites, and so forth. I'm just reading down through here. He's, this, it's not just Jerusalem. It's every, his judgment is going to happen everywhere. I've heard the reproach of Moab in verse 8. All these different places, these different nations that have turned their back on God. Verse 12, the Ethiopians. Talks about Nineveh. We've talked about that before. You know, God's judgment is going to be everywhere. Look at chapter 3, and just reading a little bit more tonight. I, I, I guess I just want us to understand how pertinent this stuff is today. It's today. Zephaniah, nobody preaches it, nobody preaches on Zephaniah. You have to look at the in, you know, table of contents to find out where it is. If you blink, you miss it. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. Anybody here ever been in New York City? New York City. See, I, 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 I really, you know, people say that the United States is not in prophecy. I, I'm sorry, but I have to beg to differ. Because when I read descriptions like this, I think, and if you go to Revelation and read about, you know, Babylon, and all the, all the merchants and all the, all the, uh, the, the economy and the, and the consumer goods that go forth. I think of New York City. The, you know, the, the bastion of the stock market, the, the world economy, world trade centers. I mean, America beats the drum that the world marches to. Even, even with our economy, is in, in, in shaky as it is, we still call the shots economically. The folks that sit in the, in the high offices in, on Wall Street and New York City, they're pulling the strings and calling the shots. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. Here he's talking about Jerusalem, but we could take that and we could... We could post that on a map. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Why is judgment coming? Because we've refused to obey what God says. Not that we haven't heard. Not that we don't know. There are so many Bibles in this country, you could probably enough to stack them up to the Empire State Building and back. 
But nobody's, there's a famine of hearing of the Word of God. It's all over the place. But nobody's listening, and nobody cares, and nobody is obedient. Look at verse 3. Just, just, her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. Just listen to this. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence. The government, the judges, the religious leaders, we've read this again and again and again. It's what we're seeing happening before our very eyes. And people want to be like them three monkeys, close their ears, their eyes, and their mouth. See not, hear not. Her prophets are light. <laughs> Man, we got, we got church light. L-I-T-E. Huh? Like, you know, we have you know, light mayonnaise. We got light, we got light church. They're treacherous. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The just, the just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning does he bring his judgment to light. He fails not, but the unjust knows no shame. God is very open about what he says. It's just the folks who don't want to hear it just shrug it off and say, well, that's just old time stuff. I've cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that none passes by. I just can't help but see them pictures of them towers coming down. Now, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about something different, but you just, just project that. And that was just a picture. I made their streets ways that none passes by. Their cities are destroyed so that there is no man. There is none inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so their dwelling should not be cut off. Howsoever I punish them, but... They rose early and corrupted all their doings. Didn't listen. What's it going to take? He says, Therefore wait ye upon me, says the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation. Even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Now, I believe Zephaniah now is looking to the future. See, now he's talking about judgment on, on the earth. He talked about Jerusalem and the nations around Jerusalem. Now he's talking about the time when God will judge this earth. He's seeing past now. For then will I turn to the people of pure language, and they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Just like all the other prophets now, when he's talking about judgment, he's giving us a hope of restoration. There is, a, there is a people, there is a remnant of pure language. There are a people who really have been changed, who really have been touched, who are really born again. In verse 11, In that day shall thou not be ashamed. He's talking about the restoration. Now, I thank God that when he talks about judgment, he also talks about restoration. Especially for his people. When he talks about a shaking, he talks about a building. When he talks about tearing down, he talks about putting up. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, a remnant, those whose hearts was breaking. Ezekiel will talk about those who sigh and cry. At the, at the pollution of Jerusalem. When we see this stuff going on around us, does it break our heart? Now, it might make you mad, but does it break our heart? I have to ask myself sometimes, I see these guys out here, does it, does it break my heart or am I just mad because they're hanging out? I went out there and there was four of them hanging out down by the door. <laughs> just hanging out there. So I went over to the to the railing and I stopped and I looked at him I said hi guy he started slowly like hey walking away and I said you guys are welcome to come in come on in the one guy says no just enjoying the weather said, oh, okay 
But you know, is it you know? Do, am, do I just not like him, or am I am I heartbroken? So I got to examine myself. Why I, I do what I want to, what I do. You know, we want to have outreach. Why? Just because you don't like him? <laughs> because you're heartbroken. He says, "I will leave also in the midst of the and afflicted and poor people, that they shall trust in the name of the Lord, the remnant of Israel." shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. You know what? I want to be a remnant in the body of Christ. Because there's a whole lot of stuff that calls itself church that ain't about nothing to do with Jesus. In all different kinds. I'm not, I'm not singling out any particular church or denomination. There's just a whole lot of stuff going on under the guise of ministry and church. They have nothing to do with Jesus. It's, rev oh, it's revival. It's, if people get hepped up and people get emotional and they, get, and they like the music and, and that's great. But they, they walk out twice the, twice the children of hell than they were before they walked in. Mainly because a lot of the people stand behind pulpits haven't been saved. They're doing the religion thing. They're doing the good works thing. They're doing the the social gospel. Here's the good part. With all these three chapters of Zephaniah, with all this dire stuff and judgment, he says this. Sing, in verse 14, O daughter of Zion, Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. You who are in the midst of this so-called revival, remember they were having a revival, but it wasn't really a revival. And there were probably those in Jerusalem that recognized that, the remnant, and God is saying, listen, you go ahead and you sing and you rejoice. Why? Because, verse 15, the Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. He was saying this before the judgment, before the exile. He's saying this. He wants them to believe in faith that there was going to come a time that they were going to see their Lord. See, the end has already been determined. The stuff that's going to happen to us as believers is already determined, regardless of what happens here. Regardless of what's happening to Christians all over this world, more martyrdom and persecution than ever has been in the history of this world against, against Christ and his people. He's saying rejoice. Because I'm promising you. It's a promise of God. In that day, in verse 16, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. This is what we're looking forward to, the remnant. Now this is written to Israel, it's written to Judah. But it's written to us because we're children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We're sons and daughters of Abraham by faith. So we can lay claim to these promises. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee. There's that song we sing. Roni, Roni, Bahatsi. It's, it's, it's Jewish and I forget. Uh, rejoice, rejoice, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Sing, rejoice with all your heart. Oh, Jerusalem. That's a promise to us. That's where it comes from. For the Lord thy God in the midst of thee will sustain thee. Verse 18, I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee. Hallelujah. At that time, God's going to undo all the bad stuff that ever happened to us. That people have done to us for the name of Christ. Well, you know, not the stuff that we did to ourselves before we were saved. But that stuff was covered with the blood on the cross of Jesus. But the, the persecution against Christians, God's going to undo it. He's not just going to, like, make it okay. He's going to undo it. People who have suffered for the gospel's sake over the last 2,000 years, I mean, people like burn at the stake. I'm not talking just somebody calling you a bad name. 
I will save her that, he, that halts and gather her that was driven out. And I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, says the Lord. Where he begins with saying, I'm going to wipe everything out. He ends by saying, but there's a remnant. When he says judgment begins in the house of the Lord, there's going to be people who are going to stand. When persecution comes to the church, there's going to be those that flee, and there's going to be those that stand. When they have a revival, and after the revival's done, 80% of them go off and do their thing, there's going to be that remnant that God's going to bless. That's the promise that he's made to us. And in this time that we're living in, it's, with all this stuff going on in the world, things that we're reading about, and I skipped over a lot, I just, you know, read, read through it again. There's promises. There's promises that he's not going to leave us alone. One more, one more verse. Go back to chapter 2, and I, I want you to read this, and, and we're going to close with this. I almost passed it over. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. That's a promise. I almost missed that. But that's a promise that we're going to stand on. God's going to hide us. He's going to cover us. He's going to supply everything we need. He's going to encourage us. He's going to uplift us. He's going to anoint us. Those who truly trust in him. See, I'm not, I'm not praying for revival. I'm not. Everybody says, God send revival. I want revival. I want to see God's spirit begin to move and change lives. It's going to last. I don't want this big you know, outpouring for about, you know, a year or two years, and then everybody kind of like fades away. I want to see people who are born again and changed and saved and made new. Not just because it's a thing, that, the fad to get into, but because people's hearts are broken, praying that for that broken ground, that, that, that fallow ground. Broken hearts. Praise the Lord. Anybody have any comments or questions before we close tonight? I don't want to close without. Praise the Lord. Next, when we go to the next prophet, it's going to be the prophet Haggai. Now, he's a prophet after the exile. We'll talk about that next week. Okay. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you. Father, I want to pray for your healing touch. For those in our, in our place, I, I, I thank God for Lisa. I pray you would continue to heal her body and touch her and strengthen her. I pray for Sister Hazel Volgris right now, who again is going through uh, attacks on her body. I pray, God, you would lay your hand upon her and bless her and keep her in a very, very special way. For all those, Father, who are enduring uh, attacks on their body, afflictions, God, we thank you and we give you glory. Father, you are able. You are our healer. Father, we pray for our brother uh, John right now, that you would bless him and his family and just keep them in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, as we go from this place but not your presence, I pray you would go before us. Father, help us. I want to be a part of the remnant. Father, I want to be a part of that group that is going to be able to stand someday and you're going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't want to get caught up in nothing but your perfect will. I don't want to get caught up in a fad. I don't want to get caught up in the latest. I, I just want, I want the old path. What this word says. Father, be with us and keep us until the next time we come together. Keep us safe. Meet all our needs. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. And all God's children said. Amen. Amen. Shake somebody's hand.